everybody if we can uh, keep our microphones on mute until we get to the question and answer section. If you have a um, question, you can always pop that in the chat and we will get to that after the lecture. Also, probably if you want to turn off your camera uh, so we have the speaker view of Phil Parker. Uh, just a reminder that you can change your view so that it's the speaker view up in the right hand corner of your screen usually. And um, we're going to enjoy the presentation. Phil, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. A quick update on the background. Two of my sons, one has his PhD now, the other one is within about a, six months. Wonderful. Congratulations, so very, very you and proud. Andy. That's that. some good parenting is what I think. Yeah. It was all my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started here because I know there was already a couple questions, right? There we go. And we are here to talk about pronghorn antelope. And there is a reintroduction process or, or they're gonna bring a population, there we go, a population of pronghorn antelope to the Coachella Valley. And so, like you said, you get a lot of questions. Is this welcome or is this welcome back? Were they here before? And okay, so the spoiler alert, yeah, they were here before. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about what our pronghorn is. A pronghorn antelope, is it, it's Antelocapra americana. This is North, North America. Um, and it is not really an antelope. Um, it is kind of one of those little creatures that are all by themselves. They got a family all by themselves. So they're a fast, they got long legs, they're a fast animal, um, but they're not really a true antelope. Um, and they, they do a lot of things that antelopes do, but they're not really, they're a prey animal. So the eyes, um, uh, there you go, you can see now, eyes are on the side of the head, they're larger compared to their head. And they have large ears that can rotate almost 180 degrees. Um, and again, very kind of, they like those open areas where they can see and they can hear. Um, so they are a prey animal, of course, they eat. So that means that they eat grasses and, and plants and stuff. They have horns, and I know a lot of you out there are going, wait a minute, they shed those horns every year. But you don't shed horns, you shed antlers. I know there's a bunch of smart people out there who are saying that, wait a minute. So yeah, you're right. And this is one of those interesting creatures. There are so many fascinating things out there. This guy is another interesting part that here he is. The, the bottom part of this is in true horn. It's, it grows right out of the head. It is connected all the time. But the outer part, the pronghorn part, where did it go? Uh, the pronghorn, this part, this two part uh, of their horn actually is shed. It's a sheath that fits on that horn. It is, it is shed uh, once a year. So it is a, a horn antler. It's a antelope, but not really. It's kind of an interesting little creature that's on that. If you look through that, um, that tree, that, that, um, all the different parts of that tree, there's the ones that go here, the ones that go there. It's in a little a branch all by itself because it's got some very unique little parts to it. It, it did, like you like mentioned before, it, it was all across North America, at least on the western side. From Canada, you, this is a great range. This, this tan part here shows their historic ranges, all the way from well into Canada, all the way down almost all of Baja and deep into Mexico. Um, and then almost, of, well, a good portion of California as well, all of Nevada, Arizona, um, Colorado, all the four corner states there, and deep into Texas. So not quite to the Mississippi, but all these plains, the, the, the thing that's uh, unique to this area is of these plain states. So a lot of flat area until you get right about here. Um, and that's what they like. So everything way up in here, all the way down through the uh, Oklahomas and Kansas and uh, all of that, that's, that's very, very flat. This is more um, deserty and there are some higher areas and some canyons and stuff, but all of these are the plain states. So interesting stuff. And again, that's their historic range. 
Um, one of the things we want to show is that the current range where you might find them is the greenish parts. And I'm a guy, so I know I'm going to give the colors wrong. But this, these, this darker area here, and you'll see that it is much more fragmented. It's a smaller areas for, for populations. And I haven't seen any in Arizona yet, but I have seen them in New Mexico. And that, to me, that was very exciting. And my wife's used to it now. I'm jumping around the car. Look, what I look, look. And they're like, yeah, I know. So um, down into Baja, interesting, there's small little populations. You'll notice, though, there aren't any populations listed here in California. There have been reintroductions here in about in uh, the middle part of the of the state. There is a small population that started there, and we're talking about way down here in the Coachella Valley starting another population. Uh, one of the reasons why did we fragment? Why does this happen here? Is that one of the reasons I'll get into a little more de detail here is is basically people. We have built cities and roads and so forth. And so that breaks up or fragments the population that used to be out here. And again, the history, the history of the numbers of the um, they used to call it the ghost of the ghost of the prairie. Um, uh, those kind of they're the western iconic animal. Um, all the diaries they talk about just huge numbers in the thousands running across this open prairie. Um, we just don't see those anymore. Um, and again, we're going to talk a little bit more about the specifics as to why. But we've fragmented it, which is the, the biggest thing that we do to just about any creature out there is that we uh, name, an, name an, an animal that's on the red list, name an animal that's having some challenges. And one of the biggest thing is that we've fragmented their uh, habitat so that they, they just get, they don't have enough room. They just can't roam um, like they used to. Mountain lions, antelope, birds of all kinds, all kinds of things. And, and we've changed the landscape for them. One of the things we do is we build roads. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot, but creatures who are prey animals, um, especially um, birds, we find the same type of thing. A lot of birds and uh, antelope and, and deer are real leery about going into these roads that are wide open where they can be seen, where they don't see that they have any type of protection. Um, and so roads are a barrier and can be a barrier. Um, what, that's one of the things they talked about with building wildlife corridors is that they initially, as they have a, a road, cars can go on the road, and they initially thought about putting uh, corridors underneath the road, but they found out that deer and a lot of other um, animals that, went, sheep uh, particularly, they wouldn't go underneath. It was dark. Um, it's a great place for an ambush for uh, uh, predators. And so they just went, no, we can't do this. So when they decided to put um, wildlife corridors over roadways, a lot more of them are being used now. The other thing is fences. Now I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a second, but um, these are the fastest animals in North America. They run up to 55 miles per hour. Um, freeway speeds on just four hooves. It's just fascinating to me. They apparently don't jump well, though. So it doesn't take much of a, a fence, just a wire fence, that and it, it stops them. So you can keep them from going around if you just build a small fence and it corrals them literally. We introduce species of animals that compete with them. So they eat plants. They love the grasses. They eat uh, the plants of the open plains. So do these guys. Now, these guys feed us. And so um, we make money off of these guys. So we bring them out to these open grasslands and have them reproduce and grow and eat as much as they can. Same thing with these guys. So we got cows and sheep and others that we just let for a long time as open range. Um, and I, I know still that there are places where they take, take sheep out in, in different places. So um, many of us are familiar with maybe a dairy farm where there's a lot of 
cows in a confined area, but uh, our, most of our beef comes from these wide open ranges type areas, which takes away um, places for our wild animals. Again, these guys are fast, 55 miles per hour, run really fast, run well, like to run, um, don't jump well. Uh, and like the open plains, open grasslands. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about this picture. I just love this picture. You can imagine taking this, being there and seeing this. Here's this wide open expanse of all kinds of flowers. It's just beautiful in the first place. And then in the middle of that, it's that sea of flowers, are these beautiful pronghorn animals that you don't get to see very often and oh, there they pop up. How cool is that? So natural threats to uh, pronghorn um, populations used to be wolves. Um, and even though wolves are being reintroduced to a lot of areas, they are not so much a threat anymore to the populations. Um, there just simply aren't very many of them around and they are not widespread. They're, they're very localized to specific areas. Um, coyotes though are widespread. The coyotes are more of those generalists that they don't mind living near around and with humans. Um, and so they are out there and they're not so much a threat to these adults that can run 55 miles an hour, but they are a threat to the babies during the springtime. And so they will harry the, the, the herds. And so the herds may take off and they may end up leaving one or two of the little children. And of course the coyotes would take advantage of that. Of course, the biggest threat to just about every creature on the planet, including itself as humans. Um, and we may not, again, our biggest threat now, we used to eat them, we used to hunt them and eat them, um, but now, even though hunting does occur on a, on a much smaller basis, the biggest threat that humans do now is we build roads, we build fences, we fragment that habitat, and we build cities, we take water, we do all that kind of stuff to make us happy and make uh, raise our families, um, but it, as at a cost of a lot of the creatures out there. So there are groups out there who are working together, and I, you may be surprised, I was a little surprised, but there are some groups out there who are working together to try to reintroduce these animals in uh, their uh, historic habitat and their historic areas. And some of them, well, they chose the Chuckwalla Bench, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. Um, they chose the Sonoran subspecies to to populate this area. There used to be several, many, many different species way back when the old ice age, that when the ice age hit, um, there were a number of species of pronghorn antelope, some as small as two feet tall, some as high, as big as six feet tall at their shoulder. So a, a, a pronghorn antelope the size of a horse um, in large herds, roaming these wide plains areas is something to behold. And then you have the little guys. And on most of those species have gone extinct. We are down to five species. And one of them, or subspecies, probably more correct. Um, one of them is a Sonoran subspecies that's, that is adapted or better adapted to more of the desert um, type habitat. And they chose that. And they chose the Chuckwalla bench. There you go, nice little picture of our Sonoran subspecies. A little lighter color. Um, coloration can be very similar, but the little lighter color, but they all have that two pronged horn <laughs> and um, very similar um, attributes of them. They are, it's a current ongoing study and a current ongoing project. Um, I spoke with Kevin, where does it go? Oh, Kevin Clark is a biologist, works with San Diego Muse, Museum. Um, and he, this is one of the projects he's been working on for almost 20 years uh, with all the people I'm gonna show you in just a little bit. They have completed their studies. They've completed their choice. They've got everything in place. They just have some, some paperwork that needs to be signed in Washington, DC. Um, it was ready 
in 2016, 15, 16. Uh, it, but then there was a president that was uh, voted in that decided it was um, popular for not being very environmental friendly. And so things have been kind of on a hiatus. And now with a new president in, in the office, they're hoping that uh, these paperwork uh, can be signed and this project can go on going and actually get started. But everything is in place, all their studies are done, everything is ready for signatures, just hoping that soon that will happen. This is why we're doing it, these little guys. And you can see right here, the little nubbins of the horns right there. But this is the little guy. And hopefully a couple of you did the, the ah thing. I was hoping for that. Um, but this is why we're doing it, because that's the future. Why did we pick the, or not we, I did not we, but why did they, Kevin Clark and his friends, um, choose the Chuckwalla bench? And they surveyed several places, Arizona, New Mexico, um, uh, Utah, some others. And they said, all right, well, the, one of the best places is it has to have no, few or no roads. It has to be an open area with um, enough plant life to survive and maybe even a little bit of water. And then they were looking at places that already had good populations of deer. And one of the ways that you do that and monitor the populations of deer is you put out trail cams. And you have the trail cam that is constantly watching 24 seven for a certain amount of time. And they did this and they found quite often you've got several de mule deer that show up around this, this uh, trail. And which is a great indication you can show, okay, great. So they're surviving. They don't look stressed in any way. They look healthy. They look um, well watered. So there's water up there, there's food up there. So those things are good uh, indicators that a pronghorn uh, herd can survive well as well. Where is the Chuck Walla bench? Some of you already know, but there's actually a sign and right behind there is the Chuck Walla bench. Um, this is a better presentation. So for those of you like I was, that it was a little ignorant and go, my goodness, where is this place? Um, this is the I-10 that goes through the Coachella Valley. This is Scirocco Summit. This is Desert Center. Right in this area and, and down this, this area here, this is where um, Patton trained his troops to fight in the desert. And um, you, as you well know, also, there's a Navy base down here on the south side of Salton Sea. Um, there are a few other things that the military is deeply involved in this area, has been in the past and stuff. Lots of little historic things. They, they worked on the dynamics of the um, uh, dropping of the atomic bomb here at the Salton Sea. There's actually a place, where, I think it was right over this way. Um, and they call this, this is the, the gunnery range. Um, a little fun fact too is that um, Bombay Beach is not named after some place in India. It's named for the military. This the military uh, bombers would fly this way. They'd come across Salton Sea, and at that point um, of the of the shore, then they knew that as a visual calculation. All right, this is when I open my Bombay doors and that gives me time as the, to fly from here to right in here somewhere. And then I got my target, I try to drop my bombs. So that they call it Bombay Beach because that's when they open the Bombay doors to the base bottom of this um, uh, bomber jet. And then by the time they're open, you can drop your, drop your bombs over here near the Chuckwalla Mountains. Not a lot of places, not a, not a lot of living places. People aren't building houses there. There's not a lot of roads. Um, this is, again, a lot of military land. Um, military, the military owns a large amount of property in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and so they are really into, it's kind of counterintuitive, you wouldn't think so, but um, they were really into a lot of the environmental projects that we have out there. And so desert tortoise studies, and now the pronghorn studies, and a few others, all of them involve some portion, some uh, member of the military family. 
And so it, it's surprising a little bit, but they are. And they are trying really hard to, to make their footprint smaller and not just um, cement everything. So this is where it is. The Chakwala bench is, that, is this area. This is where we would, we would or they would reintroduce the, the pronghorn. And yeah, who's doing all this stuff? So the military I mentioned is the big one. So the army's down there, the uh, Navy as well. Um, side little note, um, the Blue Angels practice down in the uh, Navy base south of Salton Sea as well. So when you're hiking around out there and you're looking for pronghorn, you may see the Blue Angels practicing. And that is a lot of fun. Federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, they show up and they have a, uh, a seat at the table to make decisions. State and federal Fish and Wildlife Services, California and the United States Fish and Wildlife Services also have property and have a, have a seat at the table and have a, a say in the decision making. Private groups like the Safari Club, which is a hunting group. <clears throat> and I know a couple of you are going, oh boy, a hunting group. Why, why would they want to do that? Some of the people that are most involved in our conservation projects are Ducks Unlimited, Safari Club, and a few other hunting groups or the outdoor groups like that. Um, yes, they have a little different mission. They like to hunt things. They like to hunt and shoot things and all those kind of stuff where some of us may or may not bristle at that, but they are very, very involved and money's paid to um, conservation in a lot of areas. Ducks Unlimited is one of the largest, if not the largest uh, group that puts money towards conservation in wetlands. Um, of course, they wanna shoot the ducks, but they're also doing, and they can also um, put limits and all those sort of things. So they don't want to, great, we got three ducks, we're gonna shoot three ducks. You've got three ducks, you shoot two, let the other, or let one and then you let the other two reproduce and, and grow those populations. So everybody's happy. So it's, a, it's an unlikely maybe, or probably not somebody you thought of at first, but they're very, very involved and very concerned about conservation. Desert Wildlife Unlimited is a group that just, about preserving and conserving the desert areas in that uh, in the southern part of the Co Coachella Valley, and um, one of the ideas is that we're going to take a population, we're going to go out to the to the Chuckwalla Bench, um, and reintroduce this population of pronghorns where they used to be, um, but now there's not any out there. Oh, what is that? What's happening there? So let me get rid of that. <laughs> and so where are they now? There's a couple places in Arizona. One is the COFA, Na uh, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And you can see that here. Again, very similar areas. Nice, flat, deserty area with the hills around it. Um, so they're aware, they're, I mean, they're, they're familiar and they're adapted to this area already. So when you just change the location, it's not gonna be a big deal for them to, to adapt, uh, make changes, a little bit of adaptation, learning where the water holes are and stuff, but not big. Um, and again, they're not Roman free. Um, they are in corrals, but they're, they are fenced in. Um, but the fences are like a mile by a mile by a mile. So there's a large area. They can run a, a bit, but they are contained. And so when it's lambing time, when it's time in the spring for the have the little ones, they can go get the little ones from Kofa. And there's another one too, Cabeza Prieta. Um, similar, similar area. You can see it looks very similar. Similar plants even. Um, and just this nice wide open area um, surrounded by by little mountains. But you can go get these babies and then you can transport the babies and bring them over here to bring them over to the uh, Chukwala bench. And there will be another population of the Sonoran subspecies of the pronghorn. And that's where they are now. So key partner, partners going forward, the living desert, love the living desert. So here's a little pitch for deserts or for, excuse me, for um, uh, zoos and museums. Zoos and museums um, are lumped together a lot of times because they, they, all they, they call a zoo is a living museum. So they are 
places for to take the kids. It's a great place to go and hang out. You learn a lot. They, they're all about education, love that stuff. But they are also very, very involved on the museums, just like the looking to museum, as well as the living desert. Um, and others are very, very involved in conservation projects, in monitoring uh, the preservation projects, um, all these sorts of things. Desert Wildlife Unlimited, we'll mention them as again. There's one of the volunteers and the San Diego Safari Park. So when you think about it, who has the expertise to move large and wild animals from point A to point B, from Arizona to California. And these guys are the experts. They, they brought animals from all around the world to, to San Diego, from San Diego to all around the world. So the, um, they, they're the ones that when it's time, when it's that time to take the babies, you wanna move them from here to there, you might wanna take an adult or two, that kind of thing. They know all the logistics, they know all the ins and outs, they know what to take, who to take, that kind of stuff. Um, that's where you would go for all of those, those answers, how to properly do this. Living Desert, San, uh, San Diego Zoo, San Diego Safari Park, others, they are all deeply involved in um, uh, recovering um, those species that are on the endangered species list. Um, and they're trying with zoos all across the world. They're, they've got, um, what in the horsing in the horse world called stud book or in in others you you have genetic um lists of who's involved with where so they don't have that um just those two parents who are, are going to create all the children they have uh, a book that says okay we got uh, a male in in germany and we've got a female in in venezuela and we they are genetically um diverse enough that that's going to keep that population of whatever, jaguars, leopards, Sonoran public, <laughs> pronghorn antelope, um, healthy, and we can continue growing this, these numbers of these animals so that we can educate the public and we may be able to actually reintroduce them into wild and watch them thrive. How fun is that? So these are all involved, museums are involved. It's really exciting to see these kind of things come to fruition. I know there's a couple of you out there who are going, man, this sounds like a lot of fun. Love to be a part of this. Um, wouldn't it be fun to take a baby antelope, put it out there and let it run? How fun is that? Those kind of things. Yes, you can volunteer, but not yet. There is a time that, that, that we are Kevin Clark and others are hoping that, that everything gets signed and the project can get get the okay, the go, and then you can, you, they'll, they'll put out the word and say, anybody interested in building fences, anybody interested in put, building out um, uh, little bubblers and water and stuff um, like they do with the big horn. Um, there's a variety of things. Anybody interested in putting up trail cams to monitor the new populations? All of these kind of things that are are expected and, and we, we hope will happen um, are not ready yet. But yeah, you can watch on Facebook, watch the, <clears throat> watch the San Diego Safari Park, watch the Living Desert. Look into museum may actually put something in there as well as soon as they know they'll share. Um, Twitter, internet, anything you, you can find it on the internet, Google it, find out these different things. I doubt the military will share, but most everybody else will. So that's my presentation for now. I'm ready, willing, and able to answer any questions I possibly can. Um, but right now, we got to run. And I'll stop sharing here and give it to whoever. Wonderful. Thank, I love the gotta run. That's one of my favorite parts. Besides the baby, which I know there were lots of awes because there was from me. So um, I know that we have some questions here. So I've got a few in the chat. I have one that was emailed to me ahead of time. But before we jump into that, uh, we're going to have Stephanie from High Desert Nature Museum share with us about our next lecture, which you're going to want to mark your calendars um, because it's at the end of this month. So let's see, Stephanie, um, did I, okay. there we go. Am I, 
Sorry, I'm like so used to being muted. <laughs> so uh, we are not going to have a lecture in September. I was trying to schedule the upcoming lecture for September, but my speaker can only do August because he has to go back teaching. Um, and for those who are not from up here, the High Desert Nature Museum received a Kite Humanities Grant in um, 2018, and we finally finished the program and have now an exhibit on the history of Giant Rock. And if you don't know about Giant Rock, you definitely have to come here, but um, things happen at Giant Rock. People lived under it, people blew themselves up under it, aliens have been spotted it, UFOs landed around it, there was an airport, and uh, the end outcome was the building of a rejuvenation machine. And so our speaker, Daniel Paul, is going to talk about uh, the inception and building of the Integratron, the rejuvenation machine that was built by Fantasse. And Fantasse was advised to how to build this machine by an out of space person named Torgonda, who visited him at Giant Rock on August 24th, 1953. So it's the 68th anniversary of the visit of the alien. <laughs> so um, if you are interested in some of the more bizarre desert history and stories, um, it would be lovely to see you there. You can sign up on the High Desert Nature Museum website. Um, you can go to the High Desert Nature Museum Facebook. Um, Sharla is going to share it on her Facebook and um, we'd love to see you. And one more thing, if you are interested in music, uh, the High Desert Nature Museum on the 22nd has a small early music chamber music event in that in the museum, but you can also purchase Zoom tickets. Um, the program is called the Post Pestilence Consular, and it's, and it's enchanting music from the Middle Ages after the Black Death to show you that people even back then did not lose their spirit. All right, that's it. Thank you, Stephanie. So um, do check out next time you're in the area, their giant rock exhibit is wonderful. I got to, when you're a museum person, you get to go do fun stuff and check out other museum people's new exhibits, even a little bit ahead of time, but that's open. So go check that out. And this lecture sounds fascinating and who doesn't love bizarre desert stuff for sure. <laughs> so let's look forward to that. Um, so let's open it up to questions. We've got a few in the chat already. Folks, if you'd like to turn on your cameras and um, we, we can unmute, you can ask the questions or you can pop them in the chat. But let's see. So first we have um, after my own heart and awe for the baby and what are the babies called? I believe they're lambs, but I, I, I might be wrong on that lambs the mm -hmm. adorable little lambs we all want to play with those <laughs> all right so let's see um g freeman asks if there is success in reintroducing them to the area what is the implication of climate change for the animals and that's that's a great question because there's an awful lot um it's it's complicated um climate change is complicated um so yes the dry places are going to get drier the wet places are going to get wetter it's going to change weather in a lot of places it's going to be very interesting to see there is a chance again at some point in the future but um there is a chance we may usher in a new ice age much quicker than it should so all of those things are big questions and lots of, yeah, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to um, just about everything? But in this case, um, we are hoping that the, the major changes, the dry places get drier, are gonna be 20, 30, 40, 50 years out, and that they've already been, as we saw that those historic ranges, they've already been through a, an ice age, they've already been through a part where it dried out. And so they're actually, the specifically the Sonoran subspecies are more adapted to a drier area. They get most of their, their water from their food, which is the plants. And so they will probably do better than we will. Along those lines, Phil, and I can't, um, I know as we were reviewing your slides ahead of time, you mentioned how uh, long the pronghorn, it, it was pretty recent that they were here in the Southern California desert, isn't it? What, yeah. what changed things for the pronghorn here? Yeah, and I, I, I mentioned the uh, Patton and he was, he did train his uh, troops out here for desert uh, battle. Um, 
but that was in the 1930s, um, and that was the last time we saw any uh, pronghorn antelope that were living in this area. So almost a, right about 100 years ago, um, almost, that there was a population, although small, of pronghorn antelope in the Coachella Valley at, around that Chuckwalla bench. But the, the military maneuvers and all the things that were happening there changed that. They disappeared after that. We make things change quickly, don't we, for a, an animal that adapts so well? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Stephanie asks, Stephanie Ritter, um, chance of genetic bottleneck after reintroduction. Is it worth keeping a population artificially alive with bubblers? Yeah, that's a concern with the bighorn sheep. That's a concern with a lot of these uh, small populations of reintroduced animals. And yes, and who better to have as an expert to keep, keep those kind of things in check than the zoos that are already involved. And that's one of the reasons they were, they were brought to the table um, is that, okay, how do we keep this from happening? How do we get that, um, that, uh, there's a word for it that's escaping me right now, but how do we keep that from having that inbreeding from happening? And so um, there would be a, 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 there are hopefully going to be several different populations that again, you can take from this population and bring it to this population. Whereas in the historic ranges, remember we talked about, they went from Canada to Mexico in that moving around and interbreeding or back forth, that genetic diversity was happening naturally. Now we'll do it artificially and we'll bring uh, from one to the other and introduce them to them. And so it, it will, it's gonna take some work and it's gonna take keeping clear track in those specialized books that the, the zoos have the expertise in, but it, we're gonna, that's a, a major concern that they're already thinking about. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. So we have from Lorraine Turk, she asks, has reintroduction been done anywhere else? And if so, how successful was it? Uh, yes, and <laughs> the smart aleck answer, just say yes and leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, there, if there is a, remember when we were talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the ranges in central California, um, in the, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, there's actually a population that's been reintroduced. And so far, um, it, hopefully it continues, but so far it's been very successful and very they've been very happy with it. Um, they've also, in parts of Arizona, like say Kofa and uh, Prieto Cabret, what is it, Prieto Cabret, 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 something like that. The other one that they have, um, both of those places, they've been very successful and, and they've been breeding and having the little, the, the babies, which is the key part. Once you see them breeding, it's just very exciting. And of course, this has been done in other species as well. The California condor is a great example. California condor, well, they're in, in our life, my lifetime anyhow, there weren't any in the wild at all. They had them all in captivity and they were down to, I think, 12 total. <laughs> and now there's a population is there in uh, Grand Canyon. There's a population that broke away from, from the Grand Canyon, went up to Utah all on its own. They are having babies and growing. Um, there's a population at uh, Sespe. There's a population in um, uh, another population in California. Uh, in this case, you right now, but there's a couple populations that are that are growing and they're starting to to um, populate those old habitats that they used to to fly around in. So it's it's got history and it's going to work out well. That's so exciting. That's neat. I'm. Um... Let's see, this question is from Dory Quill, our friend, and she sent this in ahead of time. Um, so she's an animal lover as well, and she's been a caretaker at the Living Desert. So she says she's very excited about the possible return of the pronghorn to the Coachella Valley. Uh, I'm also a hiking guide, and I'm concerned about fish and game possibly closing trails to protect the animals as they have in the past for bighorn. Do you know if this is planned? And uh, Dory says she believes that hikers and wild animals can live together without closing recreation access for humans. Any thoughts on that? Um, and I am not aware of there are any plans now. Uh, one of the reasons that they chose the Chuckwalla bench is not a lot of people go there. 
And so that's to protect the animal and, and have that more or less quote unquote pristine area for them to grow. Um, it's possible if it becomes more populated, but my personal opinion is with the, the state of the Salton Sea and the surrounding areas at this, at this point, and like you say, some of the climate changes that may be happening and some of the other issues, I don't see a lot of people rushing to that area. So I, I think they're going to be relatively protected for quite a while. Uh this looks like a comment uh, from David Nichols. There was noted by the military in the mid 19th century, a population of pronghorn along the Mojave Road in what is now Mojave National Preserve. It is supposed that they were hunted to extinction in the area by the end of the 1800s. Thank you, David. Um, so let's see. Oh, this is actually, and this was sent directly to me, but I, it's actually a question for Stephanie. Um, there she, Stephanie, if you have a link for the registration for the next lecture, maybe throw that in the chat. I'm on my on my tablet, and these two things do not talk to each other. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. So it, it really is best to go um, to either the High Desert Nature Museum Facebook. Oh, Vanessa says she's going to put the link on. She just jumped okay. in front of the window there. So there Vanessa so will throw the link on. She's smarter than me with those things, though. <laughs> All right, so that's coming up. Um, yeah, any more questions about the pronghorn? It's such an exciting possibility. We'll give everyone a minute. Again, you can pop it in the chat or we love seeing your faces and, and hearing your voices. If anyone wants to turn on their camera and talk, you're welcome to do that as well. So Phil, maybe I wasn't quite, so it sounds like it's sort of the population will be controlled to the area that they're in. Like you mentioned, there would be fences and things. So I, because I was wondering about, you know, you talked about populations of mule deer. Are there any, will there be any competition for resources among a pronghorn herd and the existing mule deer? Or is it more controlled than I'm thinking? Well, initially be much more controlled. You're right, it'd be a fence, they'll be within a certain area and that's to monitor the health of the animals and to see how they're adapting. I can see at some point in the future, they may lift so those fences and allow them to, to um, roam freely. Um, once the population gets to a certain uh, number and, and health-wise, it, it might be better to do that. Um, as far as competition, there's a thing in nature called resource partitioning, so that a lot of different creatures that eat the same things have different ways of getting to that resource. And so, you know, some will eat during the morning, some will eat in the afternoon, some will, some have certain specific, uh, specific adaptations like long beaks to get into the deeper sand or they're, they're woodpeckers and they're gonna drill down through the, the uh, uh, bark of the wood, those kind of things. So I don't see that there's gonna be one pushing the other out or having a challenge like that. What I can see is that um, with the introduction of the pronghorn, with the mule deer, we might see numbers of things like bobcats and, and mountain lion actually increase because the food is, the resource is bigger and more. So that could be interesting to see that. Definitely. Um, we, so it looks like we do, we've got our registration link up um, for any of you who'd like to go ahead and register for that. Uh, I'll, so I don't know if anyone has any final comments or questions for Phil, but while you think of those, I'm just going to say how glad we are to have had you today. We so appreciate your willingness to do this. And like I said, here at La Quinta Museum, we love our pronghorn. So we're always glad to know more about him. We actually did have a visitor come in and analyze our information and said, oh, this is not an antelope. We had pronghorn antelope. And they said, you have to take that out. So can we... Can we call it the pronghorn antelope? I mean, is that a, a common name for it or should we take out antelope? It is, it's, it's a common name for it, but if you wanna get specific, you can put the genus species down below. Nice, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, thanks again so much. We'll all do our, uh, everyone has their cameras off, but I know we're all applauding for you and 